So Lin Yutang you have here, he was born 1895, he died 1976. He was a Chinese writer and inventor. His informal but polished style in both Chinese and English made him one of the most influential writers of his generation. And his compilations and translations of classic Chinese texts into English were bestsellers in the West. But he did not only translate, he wrote also his own book about happiness, which was called The Importance of Living, came out 1937 and was written in English. And there he says that there are no higher pleasures. The highest pleasures are sensual pleasures. And you can make this experiment yourself. Just name a few higher pleasures and then try to see how they can be reduced to sensual pleasures. Um, and he does it. Uh, he tries to demonstrate it. So he says, let's look at supposedly higher pleasures. And you see that they really are more about the senses than the intellect. So he's attacking Mill directly, right? He's on the side of Bentham. And he says this distinction that Mill tries to make between high and lower doesn't really work. Uh, for example, looking at the picture, which would be Mill's example, you know, looking at the picture, looking at art is better than playing a game. But looking at a picture recalls really only the sensory experience of being in that place which is depicted, Lin Yutang says. So you can see he's thinking, let's say, of a landscape. You have a beautiful landscape of a place, a beach, uh, and you look at this beach picture, and the moment you look at it, you are transported in your mind into this place, onto this beach, and this causes you a sensual pleasure from being on this beach. And this pleasure is what actually makes the picture pleasurable. So if you didn't have the sensual pleasure of imagining yourself on the beach, then the picture would not be pleasurable. And um, so you can reduce the appreciation of art to the central pleasure that you get from imagining yourself being in that artwork. I mean, you can see how this doesn't really work for all of art, right? It works only for landscapes that depict pleasant places. Um, but there you can, you can argue that we also um, take pleasure from art that depicts poverty, right? There are many great portraits of poor and old people and suffering. Um, there are images of, of Jesus on the cross and so on. So these are all uh, depictions in art that are not pleasurable places. Um, and it's a little unclear how Lin Yutang's argument would apply to those. The same, he says, is true of good novels. They give us experiences of the senses. They are not primarily built of cold intellectual analysis, but we enjoy the sensual um, experience of being in the world of the novel. Again, many novels are um, displeasurable or they deal with the difficulties of the hero, especially if you think of thrillers or something where the hero or, or horror movies where the hero is uh, chased um, by some um, horror creature uh, all the way through the novel until in the end perhaps he escapes or wins. But um, uh, horror novels or thrillers or you know action novels are not generally pleasurable in the sense that we would like to really be in the place of the hero and then experience pleasurable experiences. They are novels that depict a long period of suffering uh, with a resolution at the end that is perhaps pleasurable. So again, the argument here doesn't seem to be particularly convincing, but he is, you know, brave in trying to, to make this argument at least. So music, he says, is based on the sense of sound and tone and rhythm. And religion uh, is a product of fancy, of imagination, a poetic description of truth. It degenerates when it becomes intellectual, and the most religious people are usually the least intellectual. Um, so he means to say that religion is also a source of happiness in a primitive, simple sense when religion is not intellectual, when it is not, you know, Catholic theory according to Thomas Aquinas, but when it is um, real experienced direct talking to God like an uneducated person, religious person would do it, then um, it is the best kind of religion. So um, Lin Yutang has this very basic idea of what a pleasure is. 
Sensual pleasures are better than intellectual pleasures. The purpose of art is to restore freshness of vision and sensual pleasures are stronger and more direct. And then he says, you know, in order to provoke, he's, he's a provocative writer. He's not a philosopher. He's somebody who wants to write an essay that is entertaining. And he says, I prefer talking to a colored maid than to a mathematician. Her words are more concrete, her laughter is more energetic, and I gain more knowledge of human nature by talking to her. Page 142. At any time, I prefer pork to poetry. This directly attacks Mill, right? And this idea of um, preferring uh, poetry to a game, for example, right? What Bentham uh, is supposed to have said. Only by placing living above thinking can we get away from this heat and the rebreathed air of philosophy and recapture some of the freshness and naturalness of true insight of the child. So here he makes a here he makes a distinction between um, the child's experience, which he assumes to be a direct sensory experience of the world, and the grown-up's intellectualized experience, which is somehow rebreathed air, which is second-hand and which lacks the directness and the force of a child's experience. <clears throat> now, particularly since he was Chinese, um, he tried to give an example uh, from Chinese culture uh, about what he thought was a uniquely Chinese way of experiencing happiness. And he talks about 33 happy moments that he found in a classic book, which blend bodily pleasures with higher pleasures. And now he says, you know, he considers a few truly happy moments. And these truly happy moments include things like, it is a hot day in June when the sun hangs still in the sky and there is not a whiff of wind or air nor a trace of clouds. The front and the backyards are hot like an oven and not a single bird dares to fly about. But just at this moment, when I am completely helpless, suddenly there is a rumbling of thunder and big sheets of black clouds overcast the sky and come majestically on like a great army advancing to, to battle. All flies disappear to hide themselves and I can eat my rice. Ah, is this not happiness? So um, you have this change from the heat to the freshness of the rain. And this is a, for him a moment of happiness. Or a friend, one I have not seen for 10 years, suddenly arrives at sunset. I open the door to receive him, but I don't have money for wine. So I go to my wife and I ask her, have you got a gallon of wine? And my wife gladly takes out her gold hairpin to sell it. And he calculates that this will last them three days. Is this not happiness? So now here, this is interesting, right? Because he is happily taking away his wife's gold hairpin and the wife is supposed to gladly offer it in exchange for three days of drinking with his friend. I'm not entirely sure what that the wife would indeed share um, his opinion, right, about whether this is a good exchange, the golden hairpin for uh, being drunk for three days. And the question is also, you know, has he considered the happiness of the wife? Is the wife, and this is a question, you know, about the Chinese understanding of things. Is the wife supposed to really share his opinion about the value of the golden hairpin? Or um, is he just completely misreading his wife's happiness? Is he ignoring his wife's happiness? Is he perhaps making his wife fundamentally unhappy with this behavior? Another, for example, he says, without any serious intention to build a house of my own, I happened to start building one because a little sum of money had unexpectedly come my way. And he begins to build his house and um, 
One day, finally, the house is completed and the walls are whitewashed and the floors are swept clean, the paper windows have been pasted and scrolls of paintings are hung up on the walls. All the workmen have left and my friends have arrived, sitting on different couches in order. Is this not happiness? So again now you can ask what is really happening here? Why is this important that the friends are sitting on different couches and if the friends were sitting on the same couch would this be less happiness? And why is it so important that the house is new and whitewashed and the paper windows are fresh? And would it be... Um, is this really a part of what is important about the happiness of meeting your friends, right? So it seems that the friends themselves take a very low uh, influence on his happiness, while the paper windows uh, seem to occupy most of his attention. So if you met your friends, you know, with uh, broken paper windows, uh, this probably would be less happy, but wouldn't the friends be more important than the windows? So this is a question you can ask here, right? And the last example, he says, to hear our children recite the classic so fluently, like the sound of pouring water from a vase. Is this not happiness? And now again, you can ask, what is so happy about the sound of hearing the children recite like water poured? Is this really the sound that is pleasant? Or is it the fact that they know the classics? And he seems to confuse things here quite a bit, right? Uh, because if it's only the sound of the children's voices, then of course you could just let them uh, recite some songs from the street or they could recite uh, curses, they could say, you know, bad words, but recite them sweetly like water pouring from a vase. So it doesn't seem like um, reciting anything would have the same value. What he wants to hear is the reciting of the classics. And so it is not so much about the sensory experience of reciting or of hearing the recitation. It is really about the content of what is being recited and about the fact that his children know the classics fluently. So again, this doesn't seem to be a very convincing um, description of what he wants, right? In any case, the important thing I think about Lin Yutang is that he takes seriously the project of convincing us that every pleasure is just a physical pleasure. There are no mental pleasures. And whenever we talk about a mental pleasure, we actually make a mistake. We are projecting some, some wish to be more intellectual or something, but we are not considering our true nature, which is actually um, focused on physical pleasures. And certainly this is something that sometimes can happen, that, that people are over-intellectualizing their pleasures, and that often a pure physical pleasure is indeed what is really pleasurable. And this is an Epicurean um, thing also, right? Epicurus also says that uh, the best pleasures, the most reliable pleasures, are physical pleasures that are easy to attain and they are given by nature. And so in a sense Lin Yutang is an Epicurean, um, who w would um, emphasize that um, the simple pleasures, uh, bodily pleasures, are the most important, right? The, the problem seems to come from the fact that Lin Yutang overdoes it and he tries to interpret everything as just physical pleasures and this doesn't seem to work very well.